Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Panchali Mukherjee, Associate Professor in English from Department of Arts and Humanities, Christ Academy Institute for Advanced Studies, affiliated to Bangalore University. Uh, today I'm here to discuss the concept of post-colonialism in English literature. We are actually aware of the colonial era that has been all pervasive across the globe. And uh, after the colonial era ended, uh, the era that set in uh, was called the post-colonial era. But post-colonialism is not only a time period or a historical period, but it is also a literary movement and a critical theory. So I am going to give you a glimpse into the concept of post-colonialism. I would be talking about uh, where it has originated from and what it is all about and how we are discussing this particular concept in the context of English literature. I'll go on to the next slide. This particular slide gives an overview of my presentation on postcolonialism. What are the aspects that I'll be dealing with? To start with, we have introduction to postcolonialism, characteristics of postcolonialism, finally conclusion and bibliography. Let's take a look at uh, the concept of postcolonialism to start with. Postcolonialism refers to a historical period that began after the colonies got independence from the colonizer, namely the European powers. We know about the colonial era, we know about the processes of colonialism and imperialism that were widespread across the globe and how the colonial powers, which were basically from the continent of Europe, colonized uh, different territories across the length and breadth of the globe. And uh, we also know uh, that what kind of exploitation, oppression, deprivation went on during the colonial era. And uh, finally, there was a movement uh, where all the colonies that had been colonized joined hands to get independence from the rule of the colonizer. So, that is how the post-colonial era began and uh, the concept of post-colonialism has a very profound connection to the ending of the colonial era and the starting of the post-colonial era and how the colonies started uh, asserting their identity. And so here uh, I have given an example. Uh, which is a poem by a poet called Gabriel Okara. It, you laughed and laughed and laughed. Gabriel Okara, uh, born 1921, emphasizes on the necessity of reevaluating and relearning in order to erase the internalization of the colonial, uh, sorry, colonizers' ice block ways. The poem's post colonial aspect is to confront the colonizers' contentious disparagement of indigenous African culture and worldview that silences the mockery by the warmth of his fire laughter. So basically, we see that uh, the kind of oppression or the exploitation or the deprivation that was unleashed by the colonizing powers on the uh, colonized in the colonies was on the basis of their uh, racial superiority or intellectual superiority and uh, we see although that process of colonialism and imperialism are extremely exploitative in nature but they uh, don't a philanthropic mask and as a result of that mask uh, there was the creation of the concept of white man's burden and we see that how uh, the white man's burden was explained to be a kind of philanthropic mission that was taken up by the European powers or the colonizing powers to colonize uh, the colonies across the length and the breadth of the globe because they were inferior to the uh, Europeans. And uh, that was the image that was projected. There were a lot many discourses that were created 
for the projection of the image of the colonizer to be a superior image. So here in this particular poem uh, written by Gabriel Okara, uh, basically he talks disparagingly about the ways of the colonizer, that how the colonizer has exploited the colonized and uh, their exploitation was primarily based on the superiority of the colonizer and the superiority of the colonizer basically uh, rested on the fact that uh, they were superior in terms of intellectual pursuits, in terms of culture, in terms of their civilization etc. So this particular poem can be taken to be an instance of uh, post-colonialism because it mocks the ways of the colonizer. So the colonized here who has uh, found his freedom mocks the ways of the colonizer to erase the internalization of the colonizer's ice block ways. What has been learned by the colonized from the colonizer needs to be unlearned because it is the heyday of post-colonialism and since it's the heyday of post-colonialism so there is an attempt being made by the empire to write back to the colonizer and uh, we see that there is a very uh, potent attempt being made in this particular poem to talk about the colonizer's ways in the terms of the colonized and not in terms of the colonizer. So uh, the fact that there has been a very disparaging projection of the colonized is being unwritten, is being erased and the picture is being correct. So there are uh, any number of literary pieces that have been created to correct the image that has been in circulation as a result of the processes of colonialism and imperialism and to buttress such kind of processes and it has been done by the colonizers. So there uh, is a very potent attempt being made through various literary pieces to assert the identity, to assert the nationality, the nationhood of the formerly colonized people. Post-colonialism signals the end of colonialism and imperialism which are considered to be exploitative processes and it resulted in the establishment of colonial governments in the colonies and acquiring the economic resources of the colonies. So the fact that uh, I have already mentioned that Colonialism and imperialism are both extremely oppressive, exploitative and uh, heinous processes that basically uh, bring the colonized under the yoke of oppression. These processes had to be ended, had to be done away with. So that is how there was a persistent attempt by the formerly colonized people from different colonies who uh, actually try to make inroads into the process of colonialism and imperialism and subvert these processes effectively. The neo-colonialism, which is a subtle form of colonialism, still persists. So although colonialism and imperialism have been done away with, neo-colonialism still persists in certain uh, parts of the globe or we can say uh, among the people who have been uh, formerly colonized but have attained their independence but cannot get over the awe that they have for the colonizer or the colonizer's power. It is basically a form of psychological uh, colonialism. So it has to end. It is the new form of colonialism that has surfaced after the colonies uh, have got their independence. Any Hope's poem, Australia reveals images of Australia against the backdrop of modern life. Australia, we all know, um, belongs to the second world, uh, was a settler colony and is a nation in its own right now. So there is a poem written by 
ADO uh, that is called Australia, which uh, basically talks about Australia uh, having a very drab image. It draws directly from the Australian landscape. Since it is a secular country poem on landscape, it asserts the national identity of Australia. In this poem, the geography of drab green and desolate green and rivers of water that drown among inland sands sets up a scathing attack on a land which A.D. Hope presents as geographically arid and culturally and intellectually barren. It was written by an angry young poet who laments the dearth of opportunity related to employment and vocation as a poet in the nation that is Australia. So a nation that is a new nation would not have those many opportunities to be given to its uh, People. So here in this poem, basically, A.D. Hope uh, talks about uh, a kind of nation that is extremely poor in terms of providing resources to its people. So the poet is young, is angry and laments the dearth of opportunities related to employment and vocation. A country that cannot provide employment and vocation to its people would be a country that is hollow in terms of growth and development. So basically we get to know about the angst of this poet in this particular poem that is Australia. The poem shows a total disregard for the indigenous culture that existed thousands of years before European invasions. So we see that uh, Eddie Hope uh, being a white poet settled in Australia does not take into consideration the uh, indigenous aboriginal cultures that existed in Australia thousands of years before and they do form a part of the heritage of Australia. So that is one uh, drawback that we can come across when we discuss this poem as an example of post-colonialism. Because post-colonialism as a theory basically focuses on doing justice to the dispossessed, oppressed, exploited, deprived. And that is how this uh, theory has never run out of steam. And we see that it is even valid today, although the heydays of colonialism and imperialism are over. So colonialism refers to a means of claiming and exploiting foreign lands, resources and people leading to enslavement and indentured labor as a result of migration of indigenous population to move out from the places they considered home. So uh, history tells us that how there has been the exodus of a sizable population of people to different parts of the globe, to different parts of the country or to the different parts of the world just to set up a home that is away from their original and we see that how there has been a continuous enslavement and that has led to an indentured labor force and the indentured labor force has been derived out of the migrations of the indigenous people from various parts of the world. Colonialism was accompanied by imperialism as the seizing of foreign lands was motivated by the necessity to create and control markets abroad for European goods as well as for securing the natural resources and cheap labor. Basically, colonialism and imperialism are the processes that go hand in hand. Colonialism is basically about uh, controlling the political machinery. Imperialism is about uh, controlling the economic resources of a particular territory that has been colonized. So they go hand in hand, both are exploitative in nature and one is dependent on the other. So these two processes are interdependent on each other. Again, I go back to the example of the poem that we have just discussed. In You Laughed and Laughed and Laughed, the poet narrator talks of the colonizers, 
contentious disparagement of indigenous African culture and worldview in order to buttress the myth of white man's burden, which is considered to be a philanthropic mask for the rapacious activities associated with colonialism and imperialism. So we see that uh, the white man's burden is always foregrounded in the case of colonialism and imperialism to mask the real purpose of these two processes. Basically, these two processes are uh, undertaken to accrue the uh, economic resources of a particular territory and the political machinery is also dominating so that uh, a government that is a foreign government is set up in a territory that is colonized in order to uh, facilitate the accruing of economic resources. So, these two processes are extremely exploitative in nature, but they are projected through a screen of the discourse that is said to be white man's burden. White man's burden is all about doing a service to the territories that have been colonized. So, Behind the mask, what goes on is extremely exploitative, depriving and oppressive in nature. So Africa can be taken as an example and how the African culture has been looked upon disparagingly. African culture is primarily a tribal culture and we see that how uh, the Africans have been looked down upon how they are thought to be racially inferior, how stereotypes have been created on the basis of their physical characteristics, on the basis of their skin color, which basically leaves a very bad taste in our minds. So we see that uh, such kind of exploitation, deprivation, oppression, discrimination has been undertaken behind the philanthropic mask of doing service to the people of Africa. In the late 1960s, the idea of English literature was mutating into literatures in English. Now, let's link the term or the concept that is post-colonialism to English literature. English literature as a field started with British mainstream literature. And uh, uh, Britain was a main colonizing power at one point of time. And uh, the nationality of Britain, the culture of Britain, the ethos of Britain was expressed through British literature or English literature. But as the Britishers scouted the globe and uh, in the search for territories that could be colonized. They established their control over their uh, territories and they established their own rule there. And they also taught the people of those colonized territories their language. As a result, over a period of time, those people learned their language and produced their literatures, which talked of their identity, which foregrounded their cultures, their nationality, their ideas in the medium that is English, leading to the creation of literatures in English. So basically, the literatures in English have come into existence as a result of the theory of post -war. The blanket term or umbrella term for this literature was Commonwealth literature. Towards the beginning, the nations that formed a conglomerate after gaining independence from Britain and the literatures produced by these nations came under the umbrella term of Commonwealth literature. The terms refer to the literatures produced by the colonies and ex-colonies of Great Britain. The various literatures that come under the umbrella term of Commonwealth literature are Indian literature, Australian literature, Canadian literature, Caribbean literature, etc. So all these nations are a part of the Commonwealth. And 
they have been former colonies of Great Britain. And that is how they are part of this conglomerate and the literatures that they produce are a part of the Commonwealth literature. Post-colonialism is a critical theory that attempts to change the accustomed frames of thoughts and tries to make a case for the discourses. So that is how it has never gone out of currency because its main aim has been to restore the rights of the discourses. Disorientation is a valuable and productive process. In Yasmin Gunaratne's born 1935 poem, on an Asian poet fallen among American translators espouses the views of the poetess on the cultural hegemony of the Americans over the Asians. She interrogates the supposed authority and superiority of the Americans who have successfully attempted to build a nation but have lagged behind in the shaping of skills and courtesy. She scathingly critiques America's predominance in the field of arts because of its position as a superpower nation. Now, what happens is that in this particular poem, this Poet Yasmin Gunaratne is extremely critical about America's attitude regarding its attempt to evaluate her poetry. America is thought to be a nation that is a superpower that has hegemonic control over world politics. And that is how it also controls to a certain extent that the literatures that are produced across the world. Now, the idea is to rebel against this hegemonic control. So, Yasmin Gunaratne basically questions America's predominance in the field of arts. So, her point is that just because it is a superpower nation, it does not get a free way in the field of arts. It has no right to evaluate the literature produced by an individual from a different culture, from a different country. Postcolonial literary studies and the resulting postcolonial literature refers to the writing that emerged from the countries which had been subjected to European colonization, showing distinct signs being affected by the imperial process. So we see that postcolonial literary studies and the resulting postcolonial literature go hand in hand. And the literary works that come under the umbrella term of postcolonial literary studies and postcolonial literature emerged from the countries which had been subjugated by the European powers as a result of European colonization, showing distinct signs being affected by the imperial process. Gabriel Okara's You Laughed and Laughed and Laughed highlights the colonizer's humiliating attitude towards the colonized. The poem critiques the artificial European manners and attitudes and glorifies African cultural value. So this is the clinching statement in relation to post-colonialism that the poem critiques the artificial European manners and attitudes and glorifies African cultural values which have been looked down upon and the Africans have been called to be uncivilized. And it has been uh, thought to be imperative for the European powers to introduce development and progress among the Africans at the cost of accruing their economic resources illegally. Postcolonial studies began surfacing in the 1980s and 90s as an academic discipline. Some of the representative theorists and writers in the realm of post-colonialism are Edward Braithwaite, William, sorry, Wilson Harris, 
चिन्हुआ चेबे बोल सोइंका एडवर्ड सईद एचआर अहमद होमी भाबा गायत्री चक्रवर्ती स्पेवैक्स फ्रांस कैनन बीएस नायपोल एंड सलमान रशी Here is a beautiful image uh, of post-colonialism, and uh, the image is that of England. Although England was not the only European colonizing power, we are well aware that all the European nations had launched colonial expeditions and had undertaken colonialism in various territories. So we see England extending its power over its colonies. and the image is actually a picturesque description of post colonialism as a concept that what post colonialism has actually done to the formerly colonized nations starting with attaining of independence we see that it has basically given a new identity to the people of these formerly colonized nations they feel proud to talk about their past about their national history they take pride in their national cultures they talk about their ideas in their own languages they do not need the colonizers language to speak about their ideas so all these developments have taken place as a result of the concept of post colonialism coming in and sweeping the world we see another very picturesque description over here regarding uh, the war in the sudan sudan being a nation in the continent of africa and if we look at the picture carefully we see that the britishers or the british uh, army is pitted against the natives or the africans there and the only important feature that is noticed over here is that the british army has gunpowder has rifles has bayonets to fight the war whereas the sudanese individuals or the natives of sudan use primitive weapons to fight the war as a result the war goes in favor of the british army so basically the conquest of the globe by the european colonial power powers is on the basis of gunpowder uh, is on the basis of weaponry and we see that that has been dubbed as development or progress we go on to the next section that is main concerns of post colonial theory and literature colonial discourse the colonial discourse is displayed in the poem you laughed and laughed and laughed as the poem talks about the one eyed representation of the europeans vis-a-vis -vis the resistance of the africans so the representation of the africans instead of being given by the africans were being given by the europeans as a result of which the africans were painted in a very poor color so the colonial discourse specialized in looking down upon the colonized or the natives notion of a nation or nationhood which basically came into existence during the post colonial era any hope in australia sees beyond the drabness and emptiness of australia and sees a land of immense potential an arabian desert of the mind which can resist the learned doubts or the chatter of apes which is the civilization so basically we see that one should take pride in one's nation in one's nationality 
in one's national culture, literature, language. So Andy Hope does take pride in his nation that is Australia, although he gives a very disparaging picture about Australia. But what comes to his mind is that he wants to construct the nation along newer lines, wants to create opportunities for the people of the nation. So he is basically talking about the flaws that exist in the nation so that they can be rectified or they can be corrected and more number of people get opportunities and it becomes a nation of the prosperous, of the proud. Questions of identity. This is a point that has always been the hallmark of post-colonialism as a theory. Gabriel Okara in You Laughed and Laughed and Laughed asserts the identity of the Africans to efface the oppression that the colonizer unleashed on them. So we see that asserting of the identity of the colonizer is done away with as the post-colonial era begins. And the emphasis is on the assertion of the identity of the colonized. Colonized people who were marginalized, who did not have a voice, they have been given a voice. Their plight is discussed in the context of post-colonialism so that their identities can be foregrounded. They may be from any part of the globe, but the kind of oppression that has resulted from colonialism and imperialism is similar in nature. Preoccupation with race, language, gender, identity, class and power. In Once Upon a Time and the Snowflakes Sail Gently Down, Gabriel Okara portrays the conflict of values between Africa and Europe. This poem too talks about the one-eyed representation of the Europeans vis-a-vis -vis the resistance of Africans. Now, one-eyed representation of the Europeans will be because they want the processes of colonialism and imperialism to continue and to never end. And the resistance of Africans will be to stop these processes because these two processes have actually drained the colonized territories of their resources, have impoverished those territories, have not left any resource intact in those territories. So such kind of poets like Once Upon a Time and the Snowflakes Sail Gently Down give us a glimpse into the kind of resistance that is put forth by the Africans so that they can save their territory from the rapacious greed of the Europeans. This conflict between the Western notions and the development of the native African heritage of identity, culture, tradition, nature and history is tackled by Gabriel Okara from different angles in his poetry. So basically Gabriel Okara looks at the African heritage from the perspective of foregrounding the identity of the Africans giving a positive makeup to the culture of the Africans. They are not simply thought to be cannibals or they are not simply thought to be uncivilized. The tradition of the Africans is spoken of and pride is taken in it. That how even the African cultures were extremely advanced. They may not have had gunpowder, but that does not make them an underdeveloped culture, taking pride in one's national past. Nature and history, these are the other two aspects which are taken up in the context of post-colonialism. 
that how the nature of the africans as well as the history of the africans need to be foregrounded by them and not by foreigners who give it a pejorative sense who give it a very poor makeover aporia or aperture ambivalence indeterminacy the question of discursive challenge to totalizing concepts catherine man fields 1888 to 1923 the garden party highlights through the consciousness of a sensitive white young girl namely laura her first contact with death through the death of a working class laborer who lives nearby the aporia in the short story refers to the hypocrisy of the white man's god as the penetration of the british into the classless society of a small colonial town leads to a colonial conflict which unmasks the rapacious colonial enterprise which goes on in the name of a philanthropic mission ambivalence is seen in the clash of the growing individuality of laura with the conventional attitudes of the members of her family the narrative presents a discursive challenge to the totalizing concept of white man's burden in the name of which colonialism was carried on so we see that the white man's burden was a totalizing concept and it was prevalent across the length and breadth of the globe and all the countries in the world accepted the superiority of the white man or of the european but there are aporia or apertures in such a totalizing concept it is not full proof there is ambivalence there is indeterminacy in such kind of concepts which present discursive challenges to such totalizing concepts so one example given is that of catherine mansfield's the garden party which is a short story written by her where there is a class struggle shown between the britishers and the indigenous population living in new zealand and we see that if colonialism and imperialism is all about uh, realizing the white man's burden of developing the colonized of uh, bringing progress and development to the colonized then why there is a class conflict between the britishers and the indigenous people in that society so that basically uh, unmasks the flaws that are there in such kind of a concept ambivalence is seen in the clash of the growing individuality of laura with the conventional attitudes of the members of her family so we see that laura is a white girl and she basically rebels against her family's authority to go out and help an indigenous family in which death has taken place so the whole story revolves around this particular incident showing the true face of colonialism and imperialism and showing white man's burden to be having flaws gaps aporia or aperches the next point that we deal with is cultural integrity of indigenous population the indigenous culture under the foreign rule was sidelined suppressed and openly denigrated in favor of elevating the social and cultural preferences of the colonizers it is exhibited in gabriel okara's you laughed and laughed and laughed which basically shows the denigration of africans at the hands of the westerners but the poem 
attempts to show the significance of the African culture in the face of a colonial rout and a strategy of resistance is used through the foregrounding of cultural integrity in the poem. So once the indigenous population starts coming to the forefront and tries to assert its identity through cultural integrity by showing their cultural to be superior to no, sorry, culture to be superior to other cultures or to be at par with other cultures. So that itself speaks volumes about the kind of psychological warfare that has been done by the Europeans to gain power in the colonized territories and to show the culture of the colonized in a disparaging light. So that is basically undone by the formerly colonized nations through various literary pieces or various literary works. Revisiting history to narrate historical events from the point of view of the colonized. The film Lagan, which is a brief sweeping excursion through the history of cricket in the subcontinent as it was played by the British imperialists and subsequently taken up by the Indians and then defeating the British in the game, thereby foregrounding the post-colonial perspective. Revisiting history, resurrecting history from the clutches of the foreigners and rehabilitating it is an enterprise that is taken up under the domain of post-colonialism. So here there is an example of the film Lagan, which provides a brief sweeping excursion through the history of cricket in the subcontinent. How it was played by the British imperialists and then subsequently it was taken up by the Indians. And the Indians reached a point where they were in a position to defeat the British in their game, thereby foregrounding the post-colonial perspective. Post-colonial writers used detailed descriptions of indigenous people, places and practices to counteract or resist stereotypes circulated in educational, legal, political, as well as social texts and settings. So we see that there were many post-colonial writers who were making an attempt to counter the descriptions that have been created by the colonizers to keep the colonized in chains. And these descriptions form a part Excuse me, of every other discourse, be it educational, legal, political, as well as social texts and settings. If you laughed and laughed and laughed, Gabriel Okara provides detailed description of the African culture. Like the African song, which has been projected as a motor car misfiring by the colonizers. So it is just the perspective that changes. And when the perspective changes, <coughs> excuse me, when the subject changes, the subject position changes, the description too changes. Appropriation of the colonizer's language. Gabriel Okara's poem, You Laughed and Laughed and Laughed, although makes a case for the plight of the Africans but is written in domesticated English, appropriating the colonizer's language to use the language for their own purpose, introducing words from indigenous languages into English, changing the syntax, giving it a different makeup, is all about domesticating English or any other colonizer's language. Reworking of colonial art forms. The colonial art forms are reshaped 
to incorporate the style, structure and themes of indigenous modes of creative expression, such as poetry and dramatic performances. In indigenous African culture, the narratives were originally oral, but the trend of written narratives was brought into the African culture as a result of the contact with the Western cultures. There was an attempt to rework the colonial art forms. One art form that has been reworked vigorously is the novel. How the novel was received from the West and it has been reworked. The indigenous cultures or you can say the African culture was primarily oral in nature and it got its written quality from the colonizers and that is where they started writing narratives and when they started writing narratives or they started writing their history evidence was found regarding the African Post-colonialism deals with oppression and exploitation on the basis of race, class and caste. These are the three grounds on which oppression or exploitation is unleashed on the colonized or even on the people who have been formerly colonized and are independent now. So post-colonialism has not stopped with the end of colonialism and imperialism. It has gone on because more or less it is a theory that aims at doing justice to the oppressed, to those who are dispossessed, who are voiceless, who are marginalized in a society. In Gabriel Okara's you laughed and laughed and laughed, the oppression of the Africans by the Europeans is on the basis of race. In Catherine Mansfield's The Garden Party, the subtle oppression is based on class as the death of the working class laborer who lives nearby does not make a dent in the class consciousness of the white middle class family. Cla class is one important ground in addition to which there is caste which is a ground of oppression in India. Self-determination, cultural and political. In order nation, poet fallen among American translators, Yasmin Gunaratne exhibits self-determination by questioning the cultural hegemony of the Americans over the Asians. That how the Americans can actually assess what the Asians have written. Her questioning of the supposed authority and superiority of the Americans who have successfully attempted to build a nation but have lagged behind in the shaping of skills and courtesy. So, political power does not make a nation capable of assessing the arts of a different nation or the culture of a different nation. So, because of the power gradient that exists, we see that such kind of acts are possible. So basically, post-colonialism stresses or emphasizes upon self-determination that does away with such kind of hegemonic processes. And self-determination takes place by questioning the cultural hegemony or the political hegemony of a particular nation. Postcolonialism subverts Eurocentrism, which advocates European civilization's humanistic superiority in reference to white man's burden. Since the Europeans are superior, so they have this responsibility of civilizing the globe, the whole world. This attribute is best highlighted in Gabriel Okara's You Laughed and Laughed and Laughed, where the white man's superiority is subverted by manifesting the ways of the colonized. So once the ways of the colonized are in the open, the authority and the superiority of the white man 
is subverted ruthlessly. So that is what post-colonialism has done to the colonized to restore the rights that they had been dispossessed of to them. In the Marxist context of post-colonialism, colonized is considered to be the oppressed class and the role of literature is seen to be a vehicle of ideology. This relationship is best highlighted in Catherine Mansfield's The Garden Party in the callousness of the white middle class family, the Sheridans, towards the death of a working class laborer who is a dark native and supposedly the neighbor of the rich Sheridans. It shows the power gradient that exists in the relationship. So basically, when we talk of class, we have Marxism at the back of our mind. And we know about class conflict. We know about class warfare leading to a revolution and upheaval of the social uh, apparatus and paving the way for a new social apparatus or for a new society. So we see that the power gradient is all about the master-slave relationship or the relationship that exists between the upper class and the lower class or between the haves and the have-nots. And this particular aspect is foregrounded through the lesson that is the Garden Party written by Catherine Mansfield. And we see that how the white middle class family, the Sheridans, is completely callous about the death of a working class laborer who is a dark native and supposedly the neighbor of the rich Sheridans. So it talks volumes about the kind of attitude that a particular class consciousness gives and we see that Laura is the only character who rebels against this kind of a class consciousness. Edward Said's Orientalism is a concept that refers to the texts that construct the Orient through imaginative representations on the basis of seemingly factual descriptions. It has served hegemonic purposes it justifies colonialism and imperialism in the name of a philanthropic and a civilizing mission and is best showcased in Gabriel Okara's You Laughed and Laughed and Laughed. So Orientalism is basically a concept that refers to the texts that have been created to construct the Orient. And imaginative representations have been given about the Orient. The Orientals have been called to be irrational, lazy, lascivious, etc. So these are the pejorative terms that have been used to describe them. And a discourse has been created out of this kind of a description. So basically, the literary texts that are produced as a result of post-colonialism try to subvert such kind of concepts, stressing on the superiority of the Orientals or the superiority of the colonized or the formerly colonized people and doing away with the imaginative representations that are dependent on the interpretation of the factual descriptions. Homi Bhava, born 1949, contributed terms such as ambivalence, meaning culture possessing opposite perceptions or dimensions, other meaning the colonized in the colony belonging to the margins of the power structure with the colonizer at the center of it or otherness refers to the quality of being powerless. Hybridity refers to the emergence of new cultural forms from multiculturalism. And mimicry refers to the alien and distorted way in which the colonized either out of choice or under duress will repeat the colonizer's ways and discourse. In Zulfikar Ghosh's This Landscape, These People, the questions of identity and belongingness are posed as 
The poem talks about the migration of the narrator from Bombay to London to Bombay and again to London with a reflection on his nostalgic memories of Bombay. His sense of detachment in England, his sense of alienation, he being a mere observer and finally his acceptance of his second home. Ambivalence in terms of nostalgia for Bombay and being a mere observer in England who is like a child in the museum, gaping at his new land, which is more of an exhibit for him within a glass case. The other refers to the colonized in the colony, being in a powerless state such as the Maoris of New Zealand, being ill-treated by the colonial whites, which had made Catherine Mansfield a white field, disturbed and alienated in New Zealand. Thus, the Maoris become an another in the above-mentioned power scenario. Hybridity is shown by the poet narrator in the poem, This Land, These People, as he accepts his second home in England. So, ambivalence meaning culture possessing opposite perceptions or dimensions. Ambivalence has been a hallmark of diasporic literature, literature produced by those who migrate to different lands and take up a second home in addition to their place of origin, which is their original home. Other, of course, refers to those who belong to the margins of the power structure with the colonizer at the center of it. And then we have otherness, which refers to the quality of being powerless. Hybridity, which refers to the emergence of new cultural form. Hybridity is basically incorporating the cultural characteristics of the new land that an individual inhabits at the same time having the cultural characteristics of his or her original home or his original land. So we see that these are terms that have currency in today's post-colonial theory. We are continuously dealing with these terms either in the form of literary texts or characters or different cultures that we come across in the context of post-colonialism. Mimicry of course refers to adopting the ways of the colonizer, the ways may be alien but then its adoption and its distortion refers to mimicry. So there is a repetition of the colonizers ways and discourses but with a kind of distortion. So we see that these concepts can be studied really well in the context of diasporic literature and of course in the context of post-colonial literature that we are talking about. So here there is an example of the Maoris of New Zealand and how they have been ill-treated by the colonial whites and how they have been marginalized, how they have been made the other in their own land and they are said to be possessing the otherness or the quality of being powerless. And that is the fact which irked a writer like Catherine Mansfield. Gayatri Chakraborty's Pivan, born 1942, focused on a category of those who are lower in position or those who are lower in rank in the military terms, the lower layers of colonial and post-colonial society, the homeless, the unemployed, the subsistence, farmers, the day laborers, etc. The Indians who are poor, classless villagers, as depicted in the film Lagan, are powerless and therefore referred to as subalterns, those who are without power, those who belong to the lowest rung of the social ladder, those who are said to be the dregs of the society. So post-colonialism does a service to them by talking about their plight, by trying to restore their rights, by doing the needful for them. And one classical example of this kind of uh, a category of subalterns is Lagan, which is a film about 
poor classless Indian villagers who are powerless and how they turn the tables on their British rulers by learning their game. They play it so well that they defeat the Britishers in their tactics. So here we can see two images again pertaining to post-colonialism. On one hand we can see an image where an African is shown to be holding a weapon in his hand that shows that they too have learned the colonizers ways. They too have the power to turn back and give a befitting answer to the colonizer. They are no more the other. They are no more the marginalized in the power dynamics or in the social structure. On the other hand, we have mimicry. What is mimicry all about? Adopting the ways of the colonizer or the alien or we can say the people of an alien culture but domesticating it, introducing a distortion in it. So that is mimicry. So these two pictures basically illustrate attributes of the concept of colonialism. Finally, I come to an end of my presentation and talk. So, this is the concluding part. I would like to start the conclusion with the point that post-colonialism is a historical period as it denotes an era that began with the end of colonialism. But it is also a theory, a concept that is there to stay. It will never end. Because oppression will never end, exploitation will never end. It will be manifested in different forms. Postcolonialism is a critical theory that brokers the rights of the marginalized, exploited, oppressed, and the dispossessed. It brings about consciousness, raising related to the issues of rights of the voiceless, thereby offering solutions to various issues. So that is the main purpose or aim of postcolonialism. That is, it brokers the rights of the marginalized, exploited, oppressed, and the dispossessed. And it also does a consciousness raising related to the issues of rights of the voiceless, thereby offering solutions to various issues. Those various issues may involve a plethora of issues that basically plague any marginalized community. The literature produced by the ex-colonies talking about the experiences and inverting the power structure refers to post-colonial literature and has also given rise to the domain of post-colonial studies. So the ex-colonies talking about their experiences to turn the power structure topsy-turvy, to invert the power structure, to subvert it, has given rise to post-colonial literature. And the discourse behind any text that we study in the domain of post-colonial literature is to subvert the existing power structure that is oppressive or exploitative in nature. And has also given rise to the domain of post-colonial studies. It has also given rise to post-colonial studies which is not only restricted to literature but is now being extended even to the domain of science. In the context of post-colonialism, the oppression is based on race, class, caste and gender. These are the grounds on which oppression is usually carried on. Post-colonialism looks into these foundations and tries to subvert oppression based on them. In post-colonialism, there is intersectionality in terms of oppression and exploitation. The oppression and exploitation is shown to be manifold, diverse. Post-colonialism has achieved many of its goals, but at the same time it is there to stay because it is a theory that we cannot do without. We need this theory to come to terms with oppression in day-to-day -day lives. So here I present a bibliography that has 
been instrumental in creating the presentation that I have shared with all of you. Thank you.